Hi, this is Alan, and I'll be talking today about the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Uh, I can remember back when I was in respiratory school, um, this was a very abstract uh, concept. had a very difficult time understanding the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. And my instructor pretty much just told me to remember that uh, what causes the curve to shift to the left and the right. Well, the more you study the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, you're going to get a better understanding of how it really plays a role in the care that we deliver to our patients. You're not going to see the MBRC exam specifically reference the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, but when you understand this, you're going to be looking at the relationship of oxygen molecules and hemoglobin saturation, and when you understand that, you'll be able to treat your patients more appropriately. There is one part of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve that you might see referenced on the uh, MBRC exam, and that is when they reference the P50. And the P50 is when the hemoglobin mo molecule is approximately 50% saturated, given a PO2 value of about 26.6, and we'll call it 27 millimeters of mercury. But I want to show you a little bit about the oxyhemoglobin curve. First, on the y-axis is the hemoglobin saturation. And you'll see 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 percent. And then you have the partial pressure of oxygen going from zero all the way to 100 millimeters of mercury. Well, we know that the normal PO2 value uh, in arterial blood is going to be between 80 and 100. Well, when you look at this, if you go straight up the curve, you'll see that that is approximately the flat portion, the flattest portion of the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. There's not much of a change in the steepness of the curve here. Well, that's going directly up, but when I go to the left-hand side, you'll notice that that would keep me in the range of a normal saturation, which would be 95 to 100%. So we can kind of relatively expect that if our PO2 is between 80 and 100, it's going to be here on the flat surface of this uh, oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and I'm going to yield a saturation between 95 and 100 percent. Well, this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is a unique curve because it has this kind of S shape to it. And while it's on this flat portion of the curve, we know that our patient is being properly oxygenated. Well, when the curve starts to really get to a, uh, a steep part is when we look at the PaO2 of 60 and we're looking at right about here. I can just take that up like that, and we know that a PaO2 of 60 will yield a saturation of approximately 90%. And that's our definition of hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is indicated with a PaO2 of less than 60 millimeters of mercury and a saturation of less than 90%. So we can see that it fits on this curve. When our PaO2 gets less than 60, you can see how steep this curve gets. And we know at that point that we're gonna have difficulty getting enough oxygen to the tissue and supplying the vital organs with appropriate amount of tissues, uh, oxygen to the tissue. Well, there's something else here that I wanna show you um, before I continue on to the left and right shift. And that is, when we talk about this P50, and the P50 is when the hemoglobin is 50% saturated with oxygen, okay? Normal P50 is going to be approximately, approximately it's going to be about 27, okay? And you can see about 27 right here and you're going to see that that yields a saturation of 50%. So here our P50, 50% saturated yields an approximate 27 millimeters of mercury. So what does that really tell me? Well, we know what normal is. We know normal is this, okay? Well, what could you determine if you heard on the MBRC exam that the patient's P50 was 38.
Which way did the curve shift? Did it shift to the right or did it shift to the left? Well, clearly you could tell that it shifted to the right. Okay? Well, if it shifted to the right, a right shift in the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve will specifically tell us some key things. One, if it's a right shift, we're going to see a decreased affinity of the hemoglobin molecule for O2. That means it's going to dump oxygen readily to the tissue. The hemoglobin is not going to hold on to the oxygen molecule very tightly. Affinity means attraction or strong attraction or a strong bond. And if it has a decreased affinity, it's dumping the oxygen to the tissue. The next is uh, an increased temperature. Well, temperature, temperature has a direct effect on oxygenation of the tissue and the positioning of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. I want you to be thinking about that when the curve shifts to the right, oxygen is being dumped to the tissue. Think about uh, an athlete, somebody who's running a marathon, a football player playing a football game in a hot day, or a baseball player, a tennis player. Their metabolism is really high, their body temperature gets high, and what happens? What does their skin look like besides sweat? It's very red. Oxygen is being dumped to the tissue that time, okay? Because the tissue is requiring that oxygen, that increased oxygenation. And so the patient's metabolism is up, which causes the blood to be pumped faster, going through the cardiopulmonary system, and we're seeing more oxygen being dumped to the tissue, and the hemoglobin molecule is readily re releasing those molecules because of the body temperature. Another thing would be your um, increased levels of something called 2,3-DPG. And 2,3-DPG is diphosphoglycerate. And this is found in, uh, in abundance in red blood cells. Um, and it forms bonds with global uh, globin chains of uh, hemoglobin. Um, this 2,3-DPG, diphosphoglycerate, stabilizes its molecule in a deoxygenated state, allowing the oxygen molecules to be released from the hemoglobin. So when we have increased levels of 2,3-DPG, that's letting the hemoglobin molecule release the oxygen molecules to the tissue. Okay? If we have decreased levels, the opposite's going to occur. Another thing we're going to see is increased CO2. Patient has increased CO2 levels in the blood. You're going to see that there is a acido acidotic condition in the pH. Okay, the pH is going to be low. We're going to have an increased CO2 level. Now, when the pH is low, that's directly relating to how the oxygenation relates to pH, and that's called the Bohr effect. Um, and the Bohr effect as the uh, patient's pH decreases or becomes acidic, uh, it's going to affect the uh, hemoglobin molecule in with regards to uh, oxygenation. When the patient's pH is alkalotic and uh, you see an increase in alkalinity, it's going to affect the curve in the opposite way in which the hemoglobin molecule has an increased affinity for the uh, oxygen molecule. So we're looking at the Bohr effect. We're looking at temperature, metabolism. We're looking at 2,3-DPG. We're looking at increased carbon dioxide. And this is a right shift. And we were able to tell that by the P50 because we know that the normal P50 is going to be approximately 25 I mean, 27 millimeters of mercury, okay? Now let me ask you another question now. Say the P50, you get it on a test, and you see that they say that the P50 is 22. Well, the P50 of 22, okay, that marker is not too good. 
a P50 of 22 now is yielding a lower saturation. That's not as much uh, as, as important as you being able to interpret this quickly. Which way is the curve, the P50, shifting? Is it shifting to the right or shifting to the left? The blue dotted line is normal. As you can tell, just like me, you can see that it's shifting to the left. If it's going that way, it's shifting to the right because the blue dotted line is the normal P50. Okay? Well, with a left shift, a left shift in the P50, a left shift in the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is going to be caused by an increase in alkalinity. An increased alkalinity, we're talking back again with uh, the Bohr effect and the blood's pH effect on uh, the affinity for oxygen. And if we have an increased alkalinity, we're going to also see the pH is higher. That means probably our CO2 is going to be decreased. And our temperature is also going to be decreased. Our metabolism is going to be lower. And our level of 2,3-DBG, diphosphoglycerate, could also be a reason for the curve shifting to the left. And then last would be our carboxyhemoglobin. And our uh, methemoglobin. Okay, now I'm going to talk about these for a few moments. Uh, we've already talked about the left shift. We're seeing the curve shift to the left. And that's showing that the patient has uh, an increased alkalinity, a stronger bond of the hemoglobin molecule for the oxygen molecule. We're seeing that that could be caused by decreased levels of CO2, an increased pH, a decreased temperature. Okay? Think about the contrast of what we said with an, uh, an athlete running a, uh, outside, running a long distance or performing in a football game or a tennis match or basketball, their skin is red and flush. Their muscles are screaming for oxygen, so the, the blood is dumping as much oxygen to the tissue because that's where the need is. Think about what's happening if you were to be somewhere, say like in way up north in Michigan or something like that, and you fell in the water during February. Think about what your skin would look like then. It would be a very bluish discoloration, the body would not be dumping t oxygen to the tissues to the extremities. It's keeping the oxygen to this, the core to make sure that the heart and the brain are getting the oxygen. So the hemoglobin molecule would be holding on, having a strong affinity for the oxygen molecule. We also looked at levels of 2,3-DPG. Low levels here. That means that the hemoglobin molecule is holding on to the oxygen. Well, the 2,3-DPG, again, remember, that helps form the loose bonds to allow the hemoglobin molecule to release the oxygen. Well, if they have low levels of 2,3-DPG, it's not going to release as readily. Where you have to worry about this is sometimes with stored blood that's been stored for too long, that that hemoglobin concentration of 2,3-DPG could be as low as one-third of what it normally should be. Your carboxyhemoglobin, you probably have learned in your classes in your reading that uh, carboxy or carbon monoxide has an affinity for the, ox uh, for the hemoglobin molecule over 200 times more than oxygen. So if there's just even a little bit of carbon monoxide and the patient breathes that in, it's going to displace the oxygen available. Okay? Next is our methemoglobin. Okay? And the methemoglobin is an abnormal form of the molecule forming a heme complex uh, with the ferrous ion. Well, what does this do? What does this mean? Uh, in a nutshell, because of this ferrous ion, this, this abnormal hemoglobin now, uh, it's not going to readily combine with oxygen. And because it won't readily combine with the oxygen, 
we have this problem, okay? Uh, I'm trying to think about how I would look at this. Uh, your methemoglobin, uh, if you do, if you, if you uh, run the test necessary and you can tell that the, the patient is suffering from methemoglobin, um, you could use uh, reducing agents such as methylene blue or, or ascorbic acid if the levels of methemoglobin reach more than 30 percent. Well now you see the left shift causes and you see the right shift causes and you can see the P50. If P50 is normal here and you see a right shift then you have this cause. If you see a left shift in the P50 these are the causes. I want to draw your attention because when I studied for this when I was in respiratory school I did quickly pick up on it's almost a polar opposite. That if it was a left shift, and I can remember these here on this side, then if it shifted to the right, it was the opposite. So a left shift gave me an increased alkalinity, a right shift gave me an increased acidosis, okay? A left shift gives me a decreased CO2 could be a cause. Well, on this side, we see uh, an increase in CO2. A left shift causes a decreased temp. Well, what's the opposite if it goes a right shift? An increased temp. Another reason for the left shift would be a decreased 2, 3 DPG. Well, then the opposite would occur, an increase in the 2, 3 DPG. If the right shift gives me a decreased affinity, then the left shift has to give me the opposite, which is an increased affinity, okay? So when we're looking at the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, you do need to know the left and right, and they're never gonna ask you directly on the MBRC exam, tell me what causes a left shift or a right shift. It's a concept which is relating the hemoglobin saturation to the PO2. You do need to know what normal is, and we know that this part up here that's normal. When we get to this steep part, it looks like a mountain. If you were skiing, you're probably doing fine. But when you get to this port right here, that's like a triple diamond, man. That's very steep. It's very dangerous. And if you're getting down here, you're not going to oxygenate the tissue appropriately. And if you're not oxygenating the tissue appropriately, that means you're going to put your heart and brain, the patient's heart and brain, at risk. And that's our job, is to ensure that we get the appropriate amount of oxygen to the patient just enough to make sure that we are meeting the patient's metabolic needs. Well, by meeting the metabolic needs, we need to know is the metabolism up or is it down? We can look at that several ways, and these are the ways that we're looking at it. So the more you look at the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, try to make it make sense to yourself. I think that looking at the P50 and memorizing that the P50 normal is going to be 27 millimeters of mercury or 26.6. And if somebody tells you the P50 has changed, it's shifted to the right, all of a sudden you have a P50 of 30. That means your curve shifted to the right. Okay? You'd actually see the curve. like that. Well, there's the P50 now. Well, if the P50 is here, I can see that my P50 is a larger number, and you see that the curve now is shifted to the right. Okay? If we see a left shift, then we're looking at this occur. Now the curve is over here, and we're seeing the curve go that way. Okay, I know my picture wasn't the very best there in illustrating that I drew the lines a little too quickly. But I wanted to demonstrate the purpose of the P50 in relation to the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Remember again, break the word down, oxygen and hemoglobin, okay? Disassociation, how does it associate, how it doesn't associate? And what we're clearly looking at, what causes it to shift to the left, okay? And then what causes it to shift to the right? If it's shifting to the right, it's dumping oxygen to the tissue. If it's shifting to the left, it's holding on to those oxygen molecules. Practice that. Practice drawing the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. 
Make sure you can put the things together where your normal PaO2 is, 80 to 100. That should be the flat portion. You can also reconfirm in your mind that hypoxemia is defined by a PaO2 of 60. But here it is. Well, I have a corresponding saturation of 90%. Anything less than 90%, anything less than a PaO2 of 60 is going to be hypoxemia. So these things that you've been building on, this kind of a diagram allows you to study many things at one time. Practice that. Do it over and over and over again, and you will get this concept down. And I promise you, it will help you on your boards. Thank you.